Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to the fifth episode in our mini-series on spin locks. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be taking a look at a few spin locks with non-constant back-off. So in the last video, we took a look at this optimization called passive back-off. So let's go ahead and open that up and do a little bit of a, a uh, refresher. So we'll open up passivebackoff.cpp. Now the idea behind this optimization was that we wanted to limit some of the bursty contention that we had for a spin lock when one of our threads releases the lock. So here's our class spin lock. Inside of here we have our lock method. So when one of our threads tries to grab the lock, it first um, does this atomic exchange, try to grab the lock. If it gets the lock, it returns immediately. Otherwise, it falls into this do while loop down here. And that's our optimization from the second video called locally spinning, where the idea was we wanted to read the state of the lock um, rather than write to it every iteration of this outer loop here so that we were able to get rid of a lot of our coherence misses in our L1 data cache and lower that contention some. And then within this spinning locally optimization, we have our passive back off optimization. And the idea behind this was that we don't want to say, read and monitor the state of our spin lock as fast as possible, because when one of our threads releases the lock, we don't want all of our threads to break out at the same time and try and grab the lock, because this is pretty wasteful and only one of our threads can actually get the lock at any given moment. So what we did was we inserted some delay so that when one of the threads releases the lock, we have a greater probability that some of our threads will get caught up executing this delay while other threads might break out and you know try and grab the lock, but not all of our threads. And instead of, say, using a for loop here to generate that delay, we end up use, ended up using this mm pause intrinsic which allowed us to both insert a delay into our pipeline, but also help us save on power consumption because we're not executing instructions during that time. Okay, so that was our implementation of passive back off. But one of the things we mentioned in that video was that there were going to be situations where we don't want some constant number of back off iterations. So, you know, our lock may be held for a you know, much longer period of time. And in those cases, we may want this back off number uh, to become larger, this number of back off iterations. But you know, in that same program, there might be you know, situations down the road where you know, the lock gets freed very quickly. So we don't want to be waiting for a long period of time. So ideally, we'd like a spin lock where the number of back off iterations changes depending on the circumstance. And this is what we can get by implementing spin locks with non-constant back off. So let's go ahead and quit out of here and we'll go to our non-constant back off directory. And we're gonna be looking at two examples here, one with um, one implementation with exponential back off and one where we do random back off. So we'll start with exponential back off. So here, you can see we have our class spin lock and inside of here, our lock method. And these are going to look very similar to our passive back off implementation. So the idea inside of our lock method here is we start our back off iterations at, you know, some lower bound. So in this case, min back off is what we set at the top to say be four iterations. So the same as our um, passive back off case where we're pausing four iterations every time in that do while loop. Then after we set the number of back off iterations, we go into our normal while loop where we try and grab the lock. So we first try and do an atomic exchange. If we get the lock, we return immediately. Otherwise we fall into our do while loop down here. And we pause for some number of iterations um, starting at min back off. But then instead of just immediately reading the state of the lock, waiting for it to become uh, free um, or seeing if the R spin lock has become free rather, we calculate how many back off iterations we're going to do next time. And so in this case is going to be the minimum of our back off iterations shifted to the left by one. So arithmetically, this is the same thing as multiplying by two. And it's going to the minimum between that and max back off, right? So max back off is just a number that we've specified up here as well. So we'll say we'll, we'll cap the number of back off iterations to 1024. And this is a good idea because 
um, exponential functions grow very, very quickly here. And our back off um, iterations are growing by powers of two. So we start at four iterations, then we go to eight. If we see that the log is still taken, then to 16, 32, 64, 128, you know, and so on and so forth. So this goes very quickly. So we want to eventually cap it at some point. So in this case, I've capped it at 1024 iterations. So then if we go back down to our do while loop down here, you know, this back off iterations will gradually get larger and larger and larger until it eventually caps at max back off. Uh, but again, the idea here is that we're not always pausing by the same amount. If we find the lock becomes freed very quickly, you know, it'll get caught early on and we're not going to be pausing for that long. But if you say one of our threads is just holding on to the lock for a long period of time, we'll gradually approach our max back off iterations. And instead of, you know, checking, you know, only pausing four times between every time we read the state of the lock, you know, eventually we'll get to the point where we're pausing for 1024 times before we read the state of the lock again. So this can be advantageous. Okay, so let's go ahead and benchmark this and in the same way we've benchmarked um, all of our other spin locks. So we'll launch one, two, four, and eight threads. And in each of those cases, all of our threads will run this ink function here, where for 100,000 iterations, our threads will try and grab the lock, increment some shared value, then release the lock. Okay, so we'll quit out of here. We'll compile exponential back off with all the flags we've used, used in the past. So O3 optimizations, mArch and M2 and equals native, and link time optimization. So we'll compile that, and we can also collect our numbers from last time just to compare performance. So we'll run our passive uh, back off benchmark. And so we you see we get, you know, 1, 2.2, 10.9, in about 47 you know, milliseconds for one, two, four, and eight threads, respectively. And let's try exponential back off. And I'll do perf record. That way we can uh, look at the assembly as well and understand how things look at the assembly level. And, you know, and what we end up seeing here is that we seem to do pretty well performance-wise. So we're a little bit slower in, say, the single-threaded case, so 1.2 milliseconds versus 1.01. A little bit worse there, but not much. Um, then we have, you know, for the two thread case, we're about the same, right? 2.26 versus 2.34 milliseconds. Um, but you see, where we really get the advantage is when we're in these high contention scenarios. So at four threads, we go from 10.9 milliseconds for passive back off down to 4.59 milliseconds for exponential back off. And then for our eight thread case, we go from 47.4 milliseconds down to 9.45 milliseconds. So about a 5x improvement there, right? And we can really kind of reason as to why this happens. You know, in these very, you know, high contention cases where we have multiple threads, you know, competing for the lock, it's very likely that one thread is just not going to get the lock for a while because there are seven other threads always trying to get the lock at the same time. So many of our threads will end up, you know, exponentially backing off, you know, more and more and more, maxing out that exponential back off to say 1024 iterations, and our program starts to look more and more serialized. Okay, so now that we understand a little bit about the performance and how it compares to our previous implementation, at least for this very specific circumstance of this high contention scenario, let's see what it looks like from the assembly level. So we'll do perf report to look at the assembly. And here we go. So um, the first thing we end up doing uh, inside of this implementation is we uh, set the number of back off iterations. So that's the first thing we do. Then what we do is we try and grab the lock, right, using this atomic exchange. So we try and grab the lock. If we get the lock, right, so we test and we see if we get the lock, we jump down, increment our shared value, uh, do another atomic exchange to free the lock. We decrement our loop counter, so we're doing this for 100,000 iterations. Um, and then we go back up to the top and do it again. Okay. So what about the case where we don't get the lock? So if we don't get the lock, we end up falling down through here and we end up going through this um, loop down here where we pause for some number of back off iterations. 
Um, so you can see a lot of our time here, right? About 62% of our time is, you know, ended up spending inside of this pause here. So it's a good indicator that um, why we're starting to reach that max back off iterations if all of our time is being spent in pause, or at least the lar a large percentage. Okay, now after we go through all these pause iterations where we, you know, increment the number of pauses we've done, um, or increment our loop counter, we pause, we compare to see if we're done. And if we're not done, we either jump back to the top and pause again, or we fall down here, and we just have some um, arithmetic um, or arithmetic instructions here to calculate how many pause iterations for next time. After we do that, we read the state of our spin lock. And based upon the state of our spin lock reading that, we either jump back up here and do back off again, or we jump back up to the top and we try and grab the lock. So this is the case we read, um, we saw that the spin lock had become free and we try and grab it using this atomic exchange again. Right. So we've become a little bit more complicated in our assembly, so we have to take a little bit more care in how we analyze it. Uh, but fundamentally, the ideas are very similar. We're doing an atomic exchange trying to grab the lock. We're pausing for some number of iterations uh, down here. You know, If we get the lock, we do our increment, and we use an exchange to release the lock. We just have some f a few extra instructions in the middle to do things like... Um, you know, pause for some number of iterations and calculate the number of uh, back off iterations to perform. Okay, so that's our exponential back off. And you can find exponential back off used in a number of different areas, especially things like networking. Okay, now another thing we can, you know, try for fun is a uh, random back off, right? So let's go ahead and open up that example. So we'll open up random back off.cpp. So in this case, we're going to take um, a similar approach in terms of we're going to be you know, doing this passive back off and for a non-constant number of iterations. But instead of you know, exponentially increasing, we're going to instead use a random number generator and we're going to pause for some random number of iterations and we'll use our min and max back off iterations. Um, we'll generate a random number within that range between four and 1024. So here, let's see how that looks inside of our lock method. So when we try and grab the lock, the first thing we do is the exact same, right? An atomic exchange trying to grab the lock. Um, if we get the lock, we go ahead and return. Otherwise, um, we end up dropping down into our do while loop where we get our back off iterations from this random number generator, right? Then we pause for whatever that random number of iterations is within that range then um, we read the state of the lock to see if it's become free. So every time, right, we see the lock is still taken, we, we'll pause for a different but random number of iterations this time. And our benchmark that we'll be looking at is exactly the same. So we'll be running the same ink uh, function for the same combinations of threads. So one, two, four, and eight. Okay, so let's go ahead and quit out of here. And we'll compile uh, random back off with, again, the exact same um, uh, compiler flags. So O3 optimizations, mArch and M2 equals native, and link time optimization. So we'll compile that, and we can run random back off as well. Um, and it'll do perf record so we can look at those, um, so we, we can look at the assembly for this as well. You know, what we actually see might be a bit surprising, right? It turns out our random back off ended up doing pretty well here. So we're faster in the single threaded case compared to exponential back off. Uh, so 0.873 you know, seconds or milliseconds rather versus 1.2. We're, you know, much faster in the two thread case. So 1.72 milliseconds versus 2.34. We're faster in the four thread case again by four, you know, 4.59 seconds uh, milliseconds versus 3.38 milliseconds, and again faster in the eighth thread case. So 9.45 milliseconds for our exponential back off, and 6.86 milliseconds for our um, random back off. Right. So we ended up doing fairly well here with random back off. Now it's important to note that I'm not saying that, of course, random back off is going to give you, you know, the best performance overall. It just happened to work out this way with this very simple uh, kind of trivial micro benchmark 
where we, where we just have this um, very, very high contention scenario. And in fact, what you end up seeing um, overall is that for our exponential back off, in a lot of cases, um, you'll have kind of a fusion between exponential back off and random back off. So instead of just always increasing by say, a power of two each iteration, you might pick a random number between min back off and the current max back off iterations. Right, as that increases exponentially. Right? That's a very comp common implementation of exponential back off. Okay, so that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. We've looked at a couple examples um, of non-constant back off. And you know, for fun, you can also test out you know, what happens if you use constant back off, but always for say a very large number of iterations, even something like max back off number of iterations. Um, but there's one thing that we want to think about going into the next video. All of these optimizations um, that we've looked at so far were mainly concerned with performance here, right? So trying to get our benchmarks to run as fast as possible. But one thing that we haven't uh, been concerned with yet is fairness. So we might be starving out some of our threads where say all of our threads might be getting the lock and passing it around, but one of our thread may just never get the lock until all of our other threads finish. So one thing we'll be looking at next time is a ticket-based lock that we can use to help um, Im improve and increase fairness at the cost maybe of a little bit of performance. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. As always, you can check out all of these implementations at github.com slash coffee before arch. So if we go over here to our repositories and we go to spin locks, you can go ahead and find you know, everything we've looked at today and the implementations we'll look at in the future. So we have our naive, our spinning locally, our passive and active back off, and our non-constant back off implementations here, as well as our ticket-based spin lock we'll look at next time. But again, that's gonna do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.